beginning at 7.25 Eastern Time, 5.25 a.m. Pacific Time. Now coming next, it's a news conference marking release of a report by the Senate Select Committee on POW MIA Affairs. Thursday, U.S. military action in Iraq will be the topic of a live viewer call-in program. Our guest will be Representative Norm Dix. The Democratic congressman from the state of Washington serves on the House Appropriations Committee. Phone in with your comments. Thursday on C-SPAN, the companion network of C-SPAN 2, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Earlier today, members of the Senate Select Committee on POW MIA Affairs held a news conference up on Capitol Hill. The meeting was called to release the committee's final report on its findings. The document is more than 1,000 pages in length and follows a nearly year-and-a-half investigation. That investigation included 22 days of public hearings, three trips to Southeast Asia, one to Moscow, and another trip to North Korea. During that time, the committee also heard testimony from some 150 witnesses and received nearly 200 formal depositions. The Senate Select Committee on POW MIA Affairs was created by the United States Senate in August of 1991. Six Democrats and six Republicans serve on the panel, seven of whom are veterans of the Vietnam War. The committee is chaired by Democratic U.S. Senator John Kerry of Massachusetts. I know that Senator Kassenbaum and uh, Senator Robb are on their way. Uh, a couple senators are out of town. Let me just give you a quick procedural run on what we're going to do. Uh, today we'll be making the announcements with respect to the report of each individual senator. Somewhere in the week or so following the inauguration, uh, we will as a group be going to the floor of the Senate uh, to discuss the report in a little greater detail uh, and to make some statements which will be uh, part of the appendix of the report but not part of the body. Uh, the way we work the press conference, uh, each of the senators will make a statement to you today. Uh, Senator Smith and I will uh, sum up at the end and speak last. As I introduce each of the senators, let me say a couple things about this report. Uh, this has been a remarkable process uh, in every sense of the word. I want to express the deepest appreciation, first of all, uh, to the vice chairman, uh, whose passion about this issue helped to create this committee and who has steadfastly uh, focused and with intensity helped the committee to keep asking questions, to keep focused on the central issues. Uh, I want to thank each of the members of this committee you know, a committee is not a chairman or a vice chairman, it's a committee. It's a work product is the sum of the parts. And each of the senators in this case have contributed significantly, each in their own way, each with a different perspective, uh, and they have all uh, created this work product. Uh, I am pleased, and, and all senators join me in expressing pleasure. This report accomplishes what most people said you could never do. It is a unanimous statement. It is a unanimous executive summary, each word of which has been signed off on, uh, with one or two minor footnoted uh, uh, differences of opinion, but not sufficient to cause anybody to feel that this report is not an accurate reflection of a year's work and of the truth. Uh, I would like you to measure this report. I ask the members of the media, I ask activist groups, I ask people all across America, measure this report by the totality of this report. Measure it by the weight of the evidence. Measure it also, if you will please, by those of us who have put it together. Measure us by who we are politically as a group and measure us by who we are individually as human beings. I would respectfully suggest to you that this committee is America. This committee is the South, 
from Jesse Helms and Chuck Robb. This committee is the West, Colorado and Nevada with Harry Reid, Hank Brown. This committee is the Midwest, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, the Upper Midwest, Wisconsin with Herb Cole, Nancy Kassenbaum, Chuck Grassley, Bob Kerry. And this committee is uh, the Northeast with Bob Smith and John Kerry and I think represents a cross-section. It also represents a vast array of life experience. The different people from different walks of life, different people with different views and attitudes about the world and about politics. It runs the gamut of conservative and liberal, Democrat and Republican. And all of us have come together with a commonality to try to find the truth, to take the brickbats, and there will be some, but to try to tell America what happened with respect to this issue. Finally, I also ask you to measure this report uh, for the input of a number of veterans. There is a majority of this committee that served at one period of time or another in one form of service or another. Uh, Chuck Robb, a decorated Vietnam veteran Marine. Bob Kerry, Medal of Honor winner, decorated veteran SEAL. Bob Smith, naval veteran, veteran of that period also in the theater. Uh, Hank Brown, forward air controller, decorated. Myself serving on a gunboat in the Mekong Delta. There's a broad perspective here of people who would love nothing more. And John McCain, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you got your helmet back, so I mean, The uh, words came from everyone but John McCain. <laughs> John McCain, who uh, brings perhaps the most searing and personal and unique experience of all to this committee. He spent years, five plus years, six years, in captivity. Uh, he understands this issue. So it is in that light that I ask you uh, to measure this uh, uh, entire report. And Tom Daschle, who, as you know, also made several trips and is also a veteran. Uh, <coughs> uh, let me turn now to the senior uh, member of this committee uh, and uh, the ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I thank him for his uh, continued advice and service in this, notwithstanding the personal health di difficulties he faced during the course of it. He's been there and attentive and helpful, and I appreciate his support in this effort. Senator Helms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have to confess that I was on the cutting edge of a heart surgeon. I was the cutting edge. <laughs> uh, and I have not been able to attend uh, a whole lot of meetings, but we have kept abreast <coughs> of everything that's happened through our staff, and Admiral Nance is the chief of staff for the minority, and uh, he is a 38-year uh, Navy veteran, and uh, he has had a lot of contact with uh, prisoners of war and missing in action people and families. But anyway, uh, we studied it day by day by telephone, and uh, I am satisfied that this is as good a job as could possibly have been done. And I commend you and Senator Smith and all the members of the committee who didn't have uh, a little engagements at hospitals and things like that. But I congratulate you on the work you've done. Thank you, Senator Helms. Senator Robb. We're just going to uh, run through. I'm not the next well, ranking member. If, uh, we're just going to do a balance. Okay. Uh, we did it the way we did in the committee. Democrat, Republican, we'll just bounce back and forth. Let me say, I apologize for being a minute too late with the start of the... Uh, situation over overseas. I had to pause for a very brief uh, briefing. Uh, let me say at the outset that I think this that this is a remarkable report. Uh, John Kerry, our chairman, and Bob Smith, our vice chairman, uh, are due an enormous amount of credit for me pulling together uh, a group that has already been identified as being somewhat disparate, uh, but all committed to trying to find very difficult answers. Uh, <coughs> I was one of those, I think I would have to say, that felt that a unanimous report was virtually impossible. Indeed, in the last few days, we've been having uh, virtually round-the-clock meetings to uh, finalize language. I thought that there were some simply irreconcilable issues, but because there were enough people willing to pull together and work hard and under some very strong leadership uh, from our, our two uh, chairs, uh, we were able to do it. Uh, it is a report that is not going to answer every question. 
It is not going to make everybody uh, happy with the conclusions or with all of the information, but it is clearly the most thorough and exhaustive treatment of this subject that has ever uh, been undertaken uh, and I would certainly assume ever will be. Uh, I think that one of the important elements, even for those who don't agree with some of the conclusions, is the fact that we were able to declassify an enormous number of documents. Uh, Chuck Grassley and I co-chaired the declassification task force, uh, again with the strong leadership of the entire committee, but particularly our chairman and vice chairman, and were able to get the president to sign the executive order that by the time that all of the declassification is complete, and it's just about complete now, there'll be over a million documents available to those who want to make their own evaluation as to precisely what happened, uh, whether it related to a particular loved one or some of the other uh, bits of general, general information that were not previously available to the press. I think this is a very important contribution to the process and I was uh, pleased to be a part of it. I'm also pleased that we followed up and tried to identify areas where there were some within our own society and outside that were taking advantage of those families and to try to, to at least uh, begin a better process of accounting uh, that hopefully will continue. But it's an ongoing process. I've been pleased to be a part of it. Uh, and again, I commend everyone for putting in far more hours than I ever thought uh, anyone would, would uh, uh, put in, and certainly the, uh, the chairman, the, the co-chairman, and the staff did a truly superb job, and I'm pleased to have been part of it. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Grassley. Yes. Of course, uh, <laughs> I have, by signing the uh, document, associate myself with it and the remarks, uh, the opening remarks that are given by uh, our chairman. I would also uh, make a short statement on what I see for the future. Uh, I consider today the first day of our government's new efforts to press for a full accounting. We're going to wipe the slate clean, but to the families, I say that the committee's business is finished, but I and my colleagues will continue to press hard for answers about your loved ones. I am proud to have been part with Senator uh, Robb uh, with the task force's work uh, and the key role that uh, the committee played in the unprecedented declassification efforts. And I commend my colleagues for keeping declassification a central issue. And uh, it is not fully completed yet. And one of those things for the future is to see that individually or within committee's jurisdictions that each of us serve on, to see that that is uh, completely carried through. I wish to mention two significant parts of the report that uh, will take follow-up. First, a classified distress signal found by one of the experts hired by the committee. Other experts disagreed with his finding. The possible signal does correspond to a specific MIA, and we're going to uh, give the benefit of the doubt uh, to the MIA. We will ask our government to follow up. This is the only specific evidence that we uncovered of a specific individual who may be alive today. Second, the committee will refer a case to the Justice Department for possible criminal violations. This case involves the possibility of covert operations in Laos coordinated by White House staff using private funds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Grassley. Senator Daschle. <clears throat> I want to commend uh, our chairman, John Kerry, for the remarkable job and leadership and dedication that he's shown in making this day possible. As others have said, without his leadership, without his dedication, this would not have been consummated to the degree that it has, as successfully as it has. Secondly, let me commend the staff. Uh, their work, their diligence, the incredible amount of time and effort put forth is, uh, is as remarkable as anything I've seen on Capitol Hill since coming into public life. The report is a remarkable accomplishment, but it really doesn't do the work over the last year justice. It doesn't address to the degree anyone who will read it will fully understand the amount of time that it took to come to the point where we are today in declassifying the information, in bringing forth new facts, in communicating with families, in getting the government to a point where we have virtually turned the policy to the point that it uh, is today. So in many respects, the document is the final product, but not the complete 
appreciation of all the work that has gone into uh, the committee, uh, the committee's effort thus far. Finally, let me say, as Chuck Grassley has just said, that this is not the end, but really just the mark of of uh, uh, of the committee's work thus far. The committee will cease to exist, but the efforts in the Congress to conclude its work, to continue to find the the facts to ensure that the process continues is going to be uh, a responsibility for all of us. Again, let me end with the way I began, commending the leadership, especially John Kerry and Bob Smith, for their work in bringing us to the point where we are today. Thank you, Tom, very much. Senator Kassman. I have a feeling that much has already been said that I would say, but I would reiterate myself uh, the appreciation that I believe everyone should have for the leadership that's been provided by <coughs> Senator Kerry and Senator Smith to the uh, to this committee and to the uh, to the report that's been put forward as well as the staff just extraordinary effort under some very difficult circumstances I think one of the most important things that was accomplished was the declassification of a large number of documents that in my mind should have been declassified some time ago and perhaps that would have alleviated some of the frustration of, of families uh, as they were searching for answers. I don't know that any report ever uh, answers the tragedy, of course, that many families have faced and hope to find even more conclusive answers than we found. But I think it is an extraordinary report. It, is, it has been um, an interesting and fascinating experience for all those involved, and many of us have become emotionally involved in it in ways that perhaps we would never have dreamed, such as myself, who of course uh, was not a veteran of the Vietnam War, that we ever would have. Um, but I, I believe it is an extraordinary report, thanks to the dedication of the leaders of this uh, committee who uh, themselves gave an extraordinary amount of time. Thank you, Senator Kassamon. Senator McCain. <coughs> At the risk of being redundant, but it's very appropriate, I'd like to begin by thanking Senator Kerry for his fairness, determination, and nonpartisanship. I told John Kerry earlier, and I said it only half in jest, there's a special place in heaven for him for the incredible work that he has done in keeping all of us to claim it soon, together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I really cannot praise enough his uh, dedication and hard work. Senator Smith also for his passionate commitment and drive and tireless concern. I think all of us appreciate the fact that this committee would probably have not become a reality if it had not been for the dedicated efforts of Senator Smith for this year and many other years <coughs> in the past. I'd like to thank all the other members of the committee for their commitment. I especially appreciate Senator Bob Kerry's efforts as well as Senator Chuck Robb and Senator Dashla and others. And I'd also like to thank our council and staff, our council Bill Cadena, and of course the splendid staff director Francis Winnick, who did such a admirable job under very difficult circumstances. I might add the last few weeks without pay, so that certainly indicates their <laughs> dedication and zeal. As the American people now view for themselves the fruits of our labors, I urge everybody to read the executive summary and our full report carefully and thoroughly. Despite some press accounts to the contrary, no facts, no truths have been left out or diminished. What conclusions we have drawn are fully supported by the evidence we have assembled in the most thorough investigation ever conducted on the subject of America's missing in action. We have not attempted to draw conclusions which are not and cannot be supported by facts. I'd like to express my appreciation to a few members of the press, such as Bruce Van Borst of Time Magazine, who could have published a story at one time that might have jeopardized our efforts and did not. And I'd also like to thank our friends from ABC, Mr. Banford and Mr. Walker, who were so helpful in unveiling some of the hoaxes that, fr frankly, are the most one of the most disturbing aspects of this issue. Too often in the past year, leaks, which are, of course, tendentious by nature, and the inconsistent attention of the press to the issue has resulted in untruths, half-truths, and sometimes pure fiction. Please now read the whole and unvarnished truth. We've not hidden anything from the public, neither our agreements nor our disagreements. Allegations that we have watered down parts of the report to protect or enhance the reputations of anyone are false. We have sought the truth. It's clear in this summary and report 
when all members of the committee are fully in accord on what constitute the truth. It is just as clear when we have been unable to form a perfect consensus on some aspects of the issue. Those few instances where there's, there are varying shades of opinion are greatly overshadowed by those areas where we are in full agreement. Every member of this committee wishes that we could have located and secured the repatriation of a living American. But as is clear in our report, we found no compelling evidence to prove that Americans are alive in captivity today. There is some evidence, though no proof, to suggest only the possibility that a few Americans may have been kept behind after the end of America's military involvement in <coughs> Vietnam. The committee found absolutely no credible evidence to support the contention that the United States government, under five presidential administrations, conspired to prevent the American people from knowing that Americans remain captive in Southeast Asia. All members are in accord on these conclusions, although there may be some remaining differences among members over the quality of evidence that supports the possibility of survival. However, I want to make it clear that this finding, in the wise words of one of my constituents, does not relieve us or the United States government of the responsibility to continue pursuing the fullest possible accounting for our remaining missing in action. As long as there are serious questions about the fate of some of our missing men, the governments of Indochina and the United States government are morally obligated to pursue the answers. It's also clear that due diligence in the pursuit of these answers has not been executed consistently by all officials who were charged with that responsibility. Let me caveat that by saying that many officials involved in our accounting evidence and our accounting efforts have too often been maligned unfairly by critics who have not had or did not want to have fair grounds to make such allegations. Many honorable people in and out of uniform have dedicated themselves to the pursuit of the truth. This committee respects and appreciates their commitment. No one has been more committed to this noble undertaking than General John Vesey. In my view, he is one of the truly great Americans, and we all owe him a debt of appreciation for his tireless efforts. I also would like to thank President Bush and members of, of his administration. Let me offer another caution. The remaining questions about our POW MIAs do not entitle anyone to trade on the anguish of families by fabricating evidence or intentionally disseminating information they know to be false for any purpose, whether to profit from it financially or to garner publicity for themselves. Sadly, this committee found substantial evidence that this has occurred all too often in the past. Many, indeed most Americans who have dedicated themselves to the resolution of this issue have acted honorably and with the best of intentions. Those few whose motives and methods are dishonorable cannot diminish the good work that so many private citizens have done to pursue answers about our missing, to draw the nation's attention to the issue, and to keep our government focused on achieving the fullest possible accounting of our missing. The committee applauds their faithfulness. Finally, let me conclude by entreating all Americans, as I have in the past, to be united in our common pursuit our common pursuit to find out what happened to those Americans who left their country to serve honorably in a lost war and who have never returned. As I have just noted, most Americans who have engaged in that pursuit have acted honorably. So have the members of this committee. And I want to again thank my colleagues for their dedication to this endeavor. I wish to thank them on my behalf and on behalf of my comrades who did not come home with me to the country we all love so dearly. Thank you, Senator McCain. Senator Smith, Mr. Vice Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me start by briefly <coughs> thanking the staff. Uh, is, is pretty, in the, lo the closing days of this investigation have uh, really been tough. Uh, people staying up all night until wee hours of the morning trying to trying to get uh, documents typed and, and, uh, and accommodating the views of senators. Certainly the personal staff of the members, the designees, and you all should know this, when you weren't at meetings at, from time to time, they were always there representing your views. Uh, it was interesting to see the dialogue when a staff, staff member would take on a senator uh, in an <laughs> argument on your behalf, and, and they did it well. And certainly the members, uh, there have been some difficult times throughout the course of this uh, investigation, as most of you in the press know, because you had stuff leaked all throughout the process, so you've probably been tuned in on all of it. But I, I would like to single out two members of the opposition party who, in extremely difficult times, did seek me out and, and, and talk to me. One is not here today, Harry Reid, and the other is Tom Daschle, who sat next to me during throughout the hearings. They took the time to, 
to speak to me uh, privately and uh, during some very difficult times during the pre procedures, and I appreciate it and won't forget it. Uh, and of course, to the chairman, uh, John Kerry and I were thrown together, uh, I guess, by the discretion of our leaders. We didn't know each other. <laughs> What's that? Indiscretion. Indiscretion. <laughs> Indiscretion. We didn't know each other, and uh, we took the, the time to try to get to know each other. And uh, the interesting thing is when things got very difficult, and many times they did, we turned to each other, not against each other. And I think that really sums up uh, the, the feeling that I have. Have we had differences? Yes, we have. The American people have had differences. But when it came down to getting a report written, uh, nobody threatened to walk out. Uh, we, we, we extended our hands to each other, uh, and we shook hands, and we were able to do it. And he, de he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for the fact that we were able to come to this agreement that we have today. And I do sign this report, and I'm proud to sign the report. And I want that to be known. Is every single thing in there what I would have written myself? And of course not. But where there were differences, uh, I have the opportunity to express those differences in the report. You can't be any fairer than that. And I commend the chairman for his strong leadership uh, in, in making, uh, getting the result that this committee has gotten. It was a bipartisan committee throughout. Members did not sit uh, on one side, Republicans on one side, Democrats on the other. There's absolutely not one word uttered a partisanship throughout all of the hearings, public and private, private conversations and formal uh, procedures. Never a word of partisan debate. It was the most comprehensive investigation that was ever done in the history of the issue, and hopefully uh, it'll, it'll stand, and that will be the legacy of the committee, that it was the most comprehensive. We started, we began with the other investigations that have been done in the past and build upon those. Our goal was very simple, to know what our own government knew and to get that out to you, the American people, and to the press. We did not and could not. We did try, but we could not expect to get all of the answers from the Vietnamese or the Lao or any other government. But we could expect to get the truth from our government, and I believe we've done that. Hearing records, depositions, government documents, <coughs> extensive declassification, the President of the United States, George Bush, and especially Brent Scowcroft and Dick Cheney were extremely cooperative, went out of their way to be cooperative uh, as we tried to, to, to get to the truth, gave us access to documents, Robert Gates as well at the CIA, gave us documents we no Congress member of Congress had ever had access to before. Are they complete? Well, we believe they are, but there's always going to be that kind of doubt. But Americans can take pride, I think, that we opened the issue. We didn't close the books. We opened the books on the issue as far as our government. This committee was formed because it was distrust. We tried to allay that distrust by getting the books opened. The issue's been an emotional and a contentious one for the past 20 years in Vietnam and longer than that in Korea and the Cold War. It's been contentious and emotional for veterans and families and it was contentious and emotional for the committee members as well. Let me just quickly go through three or four points and turn it over to the chairman. Paris Peace Accords. Uh, we're here today uh, because Vietnam and Laos did not comply with the Paris Peace Accords. That's the primary reason we're here. If they had, I think the issue would have been resolved and we wouldn't be here 20 years later. We're here today because the American public was sick of the war in 1973. We're here today because there were anti-war protests. We're here today because Congress voted to cut off funds. We're here today because Congress didn't support the Dole Amendment. We're here today because Watergate uh, was consuming the White House. And in this framework, in this environment, Henry Kissinger tried his best to negotiate an agreement and implement accords to an, with an intransigent enemy who exploited the American political situation, and they did it well. So in this environment, did we get a full accounting? The answer is no. But there's no doubt, there's no doubt that everyone is united today in demanding that full accounting, even today as we speak from those governments. Let me talk briefly about the state of the, of the intelligence and evidence. John McCain already referred to it. This was the most contentious area of the investigation. We knew that would be contentious. But it was also the most thoroughly examined. We spent hours and days and weeks, man hours, five or six investigators full time, investigating every single available lead that we could find. Were we complete with all of those leads? 
<coughs> we think so, with one or two exceptions, which you'll probably get into in the questions. There has been a lot of quotations in the media over the last few days because you were getting access to drafts. This is the final report. The chairman and I talked this morning. I'm not going to answer any questions about what might have been in the draft, what you thought was in the draft. This is the draft. This is the report. Anything else that you read is not the report. So I'm not going to respond to any of that crap. There is evidence. There is evidence, and the committee unanimously agreed on this point. I'm going to read it verbatim. There is evidence that indicates the possibility of survival of American POWs after Operation Homecoming. As of today, we also agree there's evidence that some POWs may have survived to the president, present, and some information still remains to be investigated. However, at this time, there's no compelling evidence that proves that. And that's a fact. We all agree to that. You will note in the full report that there is a majority and a minority view regarding the state of the evidence. This could not be helped. Some evidence um, members believe, other members don't. That's just the way it is. But the chairman allowed the minority position to be placed in the report on that. And you can't be any fairer than that. And I wrote it, and there are some members who will uh, uh, likely sign on to that minority report, uh, minority view, not minority report, only on that particular area of the investigation. And it does not mean that the committee is in a divisive state. We all analyzed the evidence, and other, some people came down on it in different areas differently than others. That's to be expected. The analysis centered mainly on the live sighting reports, which is where <coughs> the major differences were. There were also some differences in imagery, as Senator Grassley already uh, re referred to. I was somewhat concerned in a negative sense, and I, uh, this is only, I admit, a, a small portion of the whole picture, that DIA at times, uh, and I think the chairman shares my concern about this, expressed uh, <coughs> some opportunity to be evasive, indeed cavalier, uh, somewhat com confrontational, maybe unresponsive in some areas, and in some cases there were some incorrect facts. That does not mean that everybody in DIA was that way. Some were very cooperative, very cooperative, but there were a few instances where there were some problems. Let me conclude on this point, past wars. This was very difficult for us. The scope of the committee included all wars. We only had so much time to do this. We only had, we were sunsetted, we only had a year. So we made an attempt to get into, and we went to the Soviet Union. Uh, I traveled to North Korea. Uh, we've been to Vietnam. But North Korea and, and uh, of, of course, we were in Vietnam, but North Korea and the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union. The committee went there several times, or staff. Uh, we had the opportunity to, we formed the joint uh, uh, commission between the United States and Russia. Senator Kerry and I are members of that commission. We were appointed. We hope that that will continue. That's a recommendation I believe should, should continue. We need to open up channels now with, with China on the same thing, joint commission, because we believe they have answers. We know they have answers based on the evidence that we have received. Uh, the trip to Korea for the first time opened up uh, opportunities there to get access to information we'd never seen. Uh, I visited uh, with a couple of staff members the War Museum in North Korea, first time a United States Senator had ever been to Pyongyang. We believe we have an opportunity here now to exploit that and get tremendous, a tremendous volume of information out of there. And, uh, and also a lot of information still hangs out there from Russia on Cold War incidents. So. Although the focus of the committee was about 80 percent Vietnam, there's much more work to be done in Korea and in Russia, but we believe, and in China, but we believe we've laid the groundwork to do that if, in fact, there's some follow-up. And uh, we strongly recommend that some entity be established uh, in the Clinton administration to continue to follow up on all of these wars. Finally, the families. They've been on a roller coaster ride of emotion, misinformation, and hope throughout the whole 40-year history of the communist involvement in wars. It's been tough. And I think that all of us, all of the senators, as we went through this investigation, we made a conscious effort to be aware of that and to, be, and to understand what they have gone through. We've tried to answer their questions, we've tried to be responsive, and we will try to do that as questions continue to be asked as a result of the investigation. They were the ones that motivated me to seek the truth because they deserve no less than the truth. We think we've got the truth from the American government. Now we've got to get the truth from the communist governments, and I believe we've, we've set up a, a process to do that. We've urged the government specifically to 
centralize and declassify their records and put them in one place, one database, where these people can come to Washington and say, I want to know everything you have in this government about my loved one. Come to that spot and get it and not have to go to <coughs> six or seven different agencies throughout the government. I'd like to conclude again uh, by saying it's been an honor and a privilege to serve on this committee. We, again, uh, did not make an attempt to close the tunnel. We made an attempt to get light into the tunnel, and I believe we've done that, and I think that history uh, will judge this committee uh, in a positive way in the sense that the legacy will be a trail, a long, long trail of documents and information that had never before been released to the American people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let me, uh, let me, folks, make my comments, if I may, and as I begin to make them, I, I really want to thank each of my colleagues again on a personal level. Uh, we don't need to lead you with us through the encounter group experiences of people working at one in the morning and having the computers drop and struggle with the things we struggle with. But I will tell you that in the eight years I've been in the Senate, it's been the most personal and intense experience that I have had and really one of the most productive. And I say productive uh, with pleasure and with pride for the American people at a time when a lot of people question how hard people work and whether government works. There's a thousand plus pages here of document with 12 signatures. It's a unanimous report. And each of us implore people not to take things out of context, but to do what we tried to do. There are no blinders in this report. Where we could not make sense out of something, we said so. If there were two views on a particular piece of evidence, we put it in here. Let the American people make the judgment. We have transmitted to the archives of the United States all of the records of this committee. That is to say, even staff work product because we don't want anybody to say something's being hidden. Staff work product is staff work product. It is not evidence. And we caution people to measure it that way. But we want people to be able to go through, to the degree they want to, the same analytical process that we did, view the same evidence we did, and to know, most importantly, that nothing is being held back from them. Where we couldn't get something, we said so. There were a very few instances where we did not get what we asked for or wanted. We have laid that out in the report. And as each senator has said, through the Foreign Relations Committee, on which uh, three of us here serve, and through other committees, we will continue the process of oversight to make sure that the recommendations of this report are followed through on. But this is an honest appraisal of the evidence. Now let me run through it very quickly in summary. Number one. Now, let me say one thing. This report begins with uh, three dedications. A dedication to those who have been prisoners of war, a dedication to the families who have not ever had answers and who have struggled, and a dedication, finally, to activists, to people who have never forgotten and who, over the years, have brought us to this moment. Every single one of them deserve the profound gratitude and respect of people in this country. We also, all 12 of us, not all of us here, but all 12 of us want to impress on people. Words are very important in making judgments about this issue. The word possibility is different from compelling evidence. A presumption that somebody might be alive is very different from evidence that they are. It is time for America to deal with this issue with a reality base. And that's what this report seeks to create, the reality base from which this issue will go forward henceforth. Number one, there is the most massive declassification in history, and this issue will be laid before the American public by virtue of that, and we will guarantee those things promised to be declassified that not yet will be. We've deposed literally hundreds of people. The depositions will be in the archives. We have had even the CIA de de debriefings declassified. We have had hundreds of witnesses publicly, and we've had dozens of hearings, as you know. We have even had the first 
uh, satellite photography hearings that have ever been held publicly. So I think there is a list of information base that is unique. Secondly, the committee finds unanimously that Americans can have confidence that our current efforts providing cooperation continues from Vietnam and providing we follow through, our current efforts can ultimately resolve this question and provide the accounting to the degree that any accounting can be provided. And we are confident of that. Third, I concur with my colleague. The words here are careful. Read them. There is evidence of the possibility that some people survived in 1973. We have laid out with specificity what that evidence is, but it is a possibility. This committee finds unanimously that there was no certainty that anyone was alive. There was not even compelling evidence that said they were alive. There was a presumption and there was a possibility. Therefore, the next question arises as to abandonment and the committee unanimously finds that if you didn't know for certain someone is alive, you were operating on a presumption, you clearly haven't abandoned somebody by name or by place with specificity. Now, there is language that is also in there that states that the committee simultaneously finds that subsequent to Operation Homecoming, there was a difference in the way those people about whom the presumption existed were treated. There is a difference about how those known to be POWs suddenly became lumped into MIAs and how the specificity of their cases became lost in America, and I emphasize in America's reactions to the war. So we even dared to touch the question of blame. And we say to America, this is not a case of blame with any kind of specificity. All of us share. All of this nation shares in the attitude that existed after the war. And we want this document to be an effort to try to heal and to try to understand the nature of that beast. That is what existed back at that period of time. Now, this committee has found that there is evidence of negligence in terms of following through on things. There was sloppiness. There was, on occasion, a kind of uh, fatigue, if you will. There were lack of resources. There's plenty of things that we point to in the report which diminished the ability of people even to follow through and certainly the incentive. So we make that clear. Is someone alive today? The committee has made it very clear. You cannot prove a negative. We cannot deny the evidence. There is evidence, tantalizing evidence, that raises questions. And those questions rightfully ought to be pursued, and they must be. But questions are not facts. Questions are not proof. Tantalizing offers of a possibility, and they are real, do not prove that someone is alive. And the committee has unanimously concluded that there is no compelling evidence that proves that anyone is alive and there is no great grounds for encouragement based on the record of fraudulent photographs, that we haven't produced somebody in 20 years, that we haven't had success. There's no great grounds for telling America that this will happen somewhere in the next weeks. There is a profound hope and a profound commitment by this committee to want to see every possibility pursued and to see an honest, full accounting given. But we're trying to be candid about the realities. Six, as to the rumors and conspiracies about hundreds of people in bamboo cages or 50 or 60 held in one place at this point in time, we respectfully submit, and again unanimously, it is not arithmetically possible. If you look at the numbers and you look at the cases themselves, and we have submitted the cases with this report, not incidentally all of the evidence. There are families who know more about these cases than some of the records show. But we have shown a sample of evidence which indicates that in many cases of the most compelling cases for a possibility they might be alive, there is no indication that they were captured, no indication even that they necessarily got out safely of an aircraft or, or whatever. 
In some few cases, yes, there is an indication, and we demand to know about those, and we must know about them. Very compelling cases, and we have cited them, particularly, I might add, in Laos, where there are significantly greater questions today uh, than uh, anywhere else. Seven, and I'll end very quickly. On the numbers, 2,264 people are listed as, quote, MIA POW. This figure is not an accurate rendition of MIA POW, certainly not POW. The report states that 1,095 are in fact killed in action, body not recovered. Of these, of the rest, 1,172 are legitimately, quote, MIA. 333 in Laos, 348 in North Vietnam, 450 in South Vietnam, 37 in Cambodia, and four in China. Of these, General Vesey and the Defense Department and we have looked at the cases, and there are 305, quote, discrepancy cases, which raise questions. Might the person have survived? Or, gee, it looks like this person did survive, and we ought to have an answer. Of those 305 cases, 196 are in Vietnam, 90 in Laos, 19 in Cambodia. 61 of those 196 in Vietnam have been thoroughly investigated, and the committee concurs with the judgment of General Vesey that they did not die after Operation Homecoming, and their remains have been repatriated or accounted for. That leaves 135. The first round of investigation on those 135 is going to be completed this month. And there are no indications at this time that any of those people have survived. I emphasize at this time. Eight, cooperation of Vietnam. The committee finds that the cooperation of Vietnam, and we say in this report, is at a higher level than it has ever been, though we also note that we are sad that it took 20 years to get that kind of cooperation and that these answers could have and should have been forthcoming with the Paris Peace Accords had those accords been adhered to. We know the answers are in those countries and we must have their cooperation to get them. Nine, the committee did not conclude conclusively from any imagery or uh, satellite or from a signal intelligence that anyone had in fact signaled but the committee acknowledges the possibility that they might have and specifically looks at a couple of situations where further investigation is needed. The reason I go through this is it's terribly important to be fair with the language and to, and to look hard at what we're saying and not saying. Finally, uh, the committee concluded that the photographs, notwithstanding that uh, one family in particular or several families in particular do not accept that one is a fraud. The committee has concluded, based on the evidence we have been presented, that the photographs currently being reviewed are in fact uh, fraudulent. Uh, and as John McCain has spoken uh, to this issue, the committee condemns uh, efforts by people to take families on that kind of emotional roller coaster. It is a cruel uh, and, and uh, vindictive uh, form of punishment. We concluded, as Senator Smith said, that POWs did go to China, that there were POWs alive in the Soviet Union at various periods of time, and that there is more evidence to be forthcoming from all. My final comment. This report does not close the issue. It is not meant to. This report provides the reality base from which we can now make real judgments about probabilities and possibilities. A process is in place today, and I think gratefully and largely to the work of this committee and Senator Smith and his visits and Senator Daschle, Senator Robb, Senator Grassley, Senator Brown and others who went to Vietnam. We have a list of the things that we succeeded in getting from Vietnam. A huge amount has happened in the last year, my friends, and I respectfully submit that a process is in place that we can say with confidence providing Vietnam follows through on its promises, and providing that the process itself is followed through on by us and them, <clears throat> this process can bring cloture to the accounting process to the degree that human beings can get cloture. So we submit this report with pride and with pleasure and with the hopes that it will serve the interests of uh, those who've cared about this issue 
and the country. Senator Smith, I've got a couple of questions for you. I'd just like to know if, first of all, you are satisfied that there was never a cover-up by any U.S. government agency uh, on the whereabouts of uh, missing or POWs. And second of all, I'd like to know if um, you think, you are persuaded that it is unlikely that any MIA POWs are still alive anywhere in Indochina today. The committee found uh, no evidence uh, that no evidence at all of, of uh, that could link anyone in the United States government to a cover-up, and that's uh, that's simply the facts. Those are, that's that's the evidence. There have been accusations. We investigated those accusations. We could not find anything to substantiate such a thing happening. Uh, erroneous reports of information, sometimes <coughs> misinformation, but cover-up, no. Uh, the second question was, do I, I'm are sorry? Are persuaded that it is unlikely that there are any live MIA POW American servicemen in anywhere in Indochina today? Well, as I gave, uh, as, I, as I indicated in my uh, minority view, that goes down to the interpretation of evidence. You know, when it, when it comes down to, to, to the real nitty-gritty here, when the rubber hits the road, the source of the evidence and how that evidence uh, concentrates is really have to ha how you have to make those decisions. There were disagreements on that, and we we, we noted those in the report. Uh, and in my personal opinion, uh, I believe that there is evidence that people survived after 1973 and may be alive today. There is evidence. It is, as Senator Kerry correctly said, and as I said, it is not compelling uh, enough to prove. Period. I mean, that's a fact. It is not compelling enough to prove. But is there evidence? The answer is yes, in my opinion, but not compelling enough to prove it. Well, sir, Grassley sir, but, but a, Senator Grassley referred to a covert operation. Did you come to any conclusion regarding whether there were any covert operations under any auspices to attempt to extract POWs, and what were the findings? Well, the answer is yes, there, there were. They've been uh, testified to, and there is a, a section of the report that deals with it to the degree classification permits it, but the answer is yes, they were. They were not successful. In fact, the evidence was inconclusive as to whether or not anybody really was there. Sir, yeah. sir you, you keep referring to the state of the evidence, but the evidence is there for you all to draw conclusions or, or opi make opinions about. I, I want to call Senator Smith back. Sir, forgetting your comments on the state of the evidence, do you believe there is a likelihood there are today, today survivors? Do I believe it's a likelihood what? That, there is li that it is likely that there are still people there. It's, it, you see, the problem is that this is, this is a factual report. And when you start getting into likelihood and opinions, we've all expressed, every senator examined all of the evidence. Some senators rule out evidence as not being valid. Some senators can't rule some of it out, and some senators support some of it. But when you, when you move the evidentiary plane from evidence, which I believe there's ample evidence, a, a huge <coughs> amount of evidence, and it gets, you move it up to the plane of compelling to prove, you can't do that. Well, we discussed the state of the evidence, but based on the evidence, is it your feeling there are people still there? I don't know the answer to that question, for the same reason I gave in regard to the, to the, uh, to the compelling evidence. There is no compelling evidence to prove it, and therefore, uh, there are, in terms of belief, in a couple of areas of evidence, of people who provided evidence, I happen to believe those people. But that doesn't mean I'm right. But that's, that's one of the reasons why I came to the conclusion I did. And this is a personal opinion. I express personal opinion. I do not speak for any other senator. In the case of Garwood, I believe Garwood's live citing reports. That's me. That's what my belief is. But other people have different interpretations of the evidence, which is why I can't prove that Garwood is telling the truth. I can only believe that he is. Can I follow up, please, with Senator McCain, who perhaps has the most intimate perspective on it. Senator? John. John. Like you. <laughs> I was getting my orders from my Marine friend. Because of your most intimate perspective on all this, what is your interpretation of the evidence about possible survivors, given all your knowledge and experience then and now? Well, I, I'd, li I'd like to say I've, I've also, like several other members of this committee, been involved in this issue for 10 years now, both in the House of Representatives and a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee as well as a member of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, I, I think 
I think I know what you're searching for in here, so let me try and give you an answer in a, in a little bit different fashion. Um, the committee makes it very clear, and it is my personal opinion, that we have a lot more to do. There is still questions out there. There are still cases that are unresolved. There is, uh, there is a, in my view, one of the key conclusions of this committee is that we must continue on the assumption that there are Americans alive until we have a full accounting. And if we abandon that assumption, then there's the possibility that we could abandon someone. Now, having said that, I have yet to see evidence that I can point to and I say, see, there's an American alive. But I have seen evidence that says this has to be pursued. And I would like to go back to what uh, both Senator Kerry and Senator Smith said. The situation in Laos at the end of the war, it remains incredibly enigmatic when you had so many people who were shot down and so few prisoners returned as opposed to those in North Vietnam. Does that respond without evading your question? Uh, not really, sir. Okay. I mean, it, it gets closer. I guess My what I'm really... personal opinion is that I have seen no evidence that convinces me that there's Americans alive or that there is likely Americans alive, but I must continue to operate on the assumption that they are until we have c completed all of our efforts, and those require not only continued efforts on our part, but that of the Vietnamese government and Laotian government as well. Let me share with you the, the report, because we, we dealt with this, and nobody's trying to deduct it, and I don't want you to think anybody is. Uh, on page, uh, where's the language? Do you have the language there? The, the committee made it very clear. I could, well, let me just give it to you a little bit by uh, memory at any rate. The committee said very clearly that we do not believe, based on the evidence that we have, that there are grounds for encouragement to people that there's going to be somebody returned in the near future or that there's a reason to believe they will because no live sighting report has yet panned out, the photos have proven fraudulent, no deal has been offered, and we don't have the compelling evidence proves anybody's alive. Now that's a, an opinion held by ten members at least of the committee. A couple of members have a slightly different take on that, which we have noted in the report, where they suggest that they think the evidence may offer some encouragement or more encouragement. Now that's a nuance, folks, but it is certainly not evidence or reason we would suggest, I think Senator Smith's been very candid with you, uh, to say that somebody's alive or we should hold out high hope. And we hold hope, but you've got to put it on its appropriate scale here. And that's what we're trying to do. This cooperation with Vietnam, what is your read on how long it will be before the trade embargo is lifted. We're not taking, this committee's not taking a position uh, uh, on that. That's not our role. We don't want to cloud up this report. What I said when I was in Vietnam, together with the members who were there, was that we ought to take a next step. That we ought to do something in response to what they had done. The president did that. And now we, we obviously can measure whether or not he ought to do more or not. That is up to the president. And each of us, I'm sure, in the next weeks and months, will begin to speak out as individual senators. But as a committee, and today, it is inappropriate for us to assert or to be making any judgments or comments on that question. That's not for today. Yeah. Yeah, you said the, the, on the screen behind you, uh, you know, reports of new hostilities in, uh, in Iraq, and we've got another military operation in Somalia. There are some recommendations in the report regarding how future POW situations should be handled. Are you, what is your level of satisfaction right now that uh, should more uh, Americans be captured and be handled? Colin Powell, and we've talked about this, uh, and, and I know Al Patak are very sensitive, and they have already taken some measures to guarantee. Uh, a different record-keeping process and then a different accountability process. There's more to be done, and uh, the report makes it very clear, uh, but I have confidence that the military is going to treat this differently than they ever have previously. Senator Kerry, Senator Grassley alluded to a criminal referral stemming from a White, White House operation run covertly. I'd like to know, is that referral being made by the committee as a whole? Does the committee endorse that, that committee referral? Whole, yes, sir. And could you elaborate on this? Because I didn't see it alluded to in the report. Well, it's in the re <coughs> <coughs> there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's a part of the report that refers to uh, uh, private efforts uh, to deal with and contact uh, people abroad, which is contrary to the law of this country, et cetera. 
and uh, it's in the report. I can get the page reference for you, but that's going to be followed up on. In yes. connection with that question, can you tell me on what basis the recommendation to refer to, to justice is, is based? Uh, what, what was the possible violation of law? And can you also tell me if the committee recommends that uh, Ann Mills Griffith National League of Families continue to have a seat on the IAG or not? The, uh, the recommendation is based on violations of uh, neutrality and uh, Logan, uh, et cetera, uh, and surgery with respect thereto. Uh, the issue on uh, the National League of Families, the committee recommended that a review ought to take place about who ought to be members of an international agency group uh, and what the structure should be. The committee feels very strongly that the families deserve a special place and a voice, particularly the way the families were left out and abused over the course of the years. And it would be crazy for the committee to automatically recommend a termination or breach of the ability of families to feed in. What the committee did feel, though, was that the, uh, that the relationship needs to be examined to determine whether all families are adequately represented, whether other groups might ought to be part of it, whether or not there ought to be some separate structure and they're not actually sitting on a decision-making body of government, and we recommend the Clinton administration make that review. There, you uncovered some evidence of private groups using allegedly fraudulent means to raise money for these ventures over there. What kind of follow-up, if any, is there going to be on those individual nonprofits? Where, where, where any fraud... In the gallery studio, Senator Bradley is where, now in the gallery studio. Where any fraud, he is? Where is he? <laughs> yeah. You guys see him? Where, where any fraud has been alleged here that we felt went, ro rose to a level of, uh, of criminality or of provable or questionable, it's been referred to the Justice Department, and there is a case before the Justice Department now referred by the committee. Is that in the for full report, that uh, particular case? It is case? in the report, I believe. I'm not sure that the recommendation to justice, we did that earlier. Uh, and we sent the case, it involves Jack Bailey and the, uh, uh, that particular incident of fraud, and that is before the justice. I also understand justice is looking at other issues with respect to the photographs. Can you tell us the identity of the pilot whose authenticator symbol is uh, referred to for follow-up here in the report? No, can't. I'm uh, presuming that... Uh, I can, but we're not permitted to. Presuming that prisoners were left behind or that hypothetically there may be still Americans alive, what would make it in Vietnam's interest to acknowledge that fact? Well, let's get the terminology correct, and terminology is critical to this issue. Critical. Conspiracy theories grow, reputations are tarnished out of the misuse of words on this issue, at least. Left behind is different from kept behind. The Paris Peace Accords meant that everybody was to be returned. And if there also had been the full accounting that was supposed to flow, this would not be an issue. So initially, there's a question of whether they were kept. Subsequently, and we have raised the issue in our report, after homecoming, after statements that everybody was home, but at the same time that there was some evidence that people might have been alive or people had questions, this issue changed, and we have described precisely how it changed. That is different. Now, uh, what would Vietnam's motive be, is your question? Uh, what would their motive be to acknowledge today that we, they we were held that prisoners? Issue. That issue is raised in this report in the executive summary. We cite the question of the uh, motive or reason that they would do it today. Uh, the vast majority of the committee, in fact, the committee, all of us, have serious doubts about whether or not they ever could or would be able to. And we raise that in the report. Uh, real incentive for them to acknowledge that they're holding live Americans if they had held the live Americans. Speaking for myself, I will say, and I will talk about this on the Senate floor, after the years of denials, after the extraordinary face-to-face -face confrontations we've had with denial after denial after denial, after all of the efforts to reach out to America uh, and to suggest that this is a new government with a new attitude on this, to then produce somebody alive uh, would obviously uh, raise 
the most incredible reaction in this country and probably be totally contrary to their interests uh, and designs. So obviously you have to weigh that kind of motive and issue into your judgments on this issue. Uh, different people have different feelings about the possibilities, but that is certainly speaking for myself. Senator Bradley has this room at 2 o'clock, and I don't want to use this. There's evidence, the possibility of somebody having survived. Is it true for Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia? Is it true for Vietnam? I'm sorry, regarding the... One at a time, and we'll try to get through here, so Senator Bradley can... Regarding the conclusion that there is evidence that indicates the possibility of survival, at least for a small number after Operation Homecoming, does that refer to Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, or just Vietnam and Laos, or just Laos, or, or, or what? It refers principally to Laos. Principally, principally to Laos. Principally, but does it include any cases of possible survival in Vietnam? It raises, there are a couple of questions about Vietnam. There's not for any significant evidence that indicates Vietnam. It's principally Laos. Is that the way you read it too, Senator Smith? <coughs> uh, we're, we're, the focus is principally on, on Laos. So there, there, you know, as again, we're, there are some, there are some different differences of opinion within the committee on evidence. If somebody tells you that it's raining outside and if you consider the person a good source, then you go look out the window. You know, if you go look out the window and it's raining, then it, I suppose that's proof. The point is, it's just the, on the basis of the sources and how the information collates together. And I happen to believe that that is evidence, and, and, and maybe I feel a little bit stronger about it than somebody else. But the point is, that does not mean uh, that it's fair to say that I can prove that anybody's life, because I can't. No, and that's, and that's, just, whether, I'm just trying to hone in on this very important point. Of it is an important point, and we, we say in the report, we make it very clear, there is scant evidence with respect to Vietnam. The principal evidence that is referred to in the Wasag minutes and in the subsequent live sightings, etc., is as to Laos. And that is where the most significant questions arise. I said that earlier in my comments. That's explained pretty well. The significant well. questions are on Laos. I'm, we got to try to race. At least in the executive summary, I don't see any language having to do with relations between the United States and Vietnam uh, on, a, on a higher level other than this specific issue. That is because this committee was not put together to deal with the policy issues as to Vietnam. Our purpose and our mandate is to deal with the accounting of MIAs and POWs. To the degree we have commented or involved ourselves with the White House on what they ought to do, it has been to further the accounting process or to improve it. But the committee was not formed, and it would be inappropriate for the committee in the judgment of all of us to make any recommendation broadly on policy. Senator Perry, could we just get a, just a reaction to the latest um, actions against Iraq and what your thoughts are, and then Senator Smith as well? Well, my thoughts are that uh, I'm going to talk to... Uh, are you senior to him? No, we're, we're, we're slowing up. Folks, we're holding up the line item veto here, and I don't want to respond to it. How about Iraq? Uh, can I just uh, a comment on Iraq? It is my perception that Saddam Hussein is engaged in two games, one principally. One is to obviously test and to put the administration on notice, the incoming administration, that he's around. But the second, and I think a more perverse one, is that he is very busy reminding George Bush as he leaves office in defeat that he, Saddam Hussein, is still there and will present the same kind of problem he did previously and I think he's rubbing salt in wounds. Uh, both of those are serious issues and I agree 100 percent with the decision of the president to take action. I think we should take action. I think they have abused the United Nations process as well as international law and I think it's appropriate for us together with other nations to respond. I, I totally concur with those you can just come to the microphone. I, I totally concur with those remarks and uh, hope that as President Bush goes out the door.